we have an opportunity here to bring presence to the ceremony that is your life. And my invitation to you is to stop whatever you're doing, wherever you are, just for this one precious moment and take a deep breath. Follow the breath into your root point and land yourself right here, right now, into your present moment. And exhale. Welcome to the space where all the magic is happening and prepare yourself to receive the wild, raw expanse that is available inside the dojo that is your life. You are the empowered center point creator of every single experience that you are drawing into your field at this time. When you recognize that and really get that in your bones, you will receive yourself as the magnet for the most perfectly expansive evolutionary curriculum that is precisely crafted for you to evolve beyond what was in order to claim all that is a match to the you who is free. And that is what we are here to do inside the dojo as we explore what it means to live a life beyond the edge. This is a Soul Fire production. Hello, beautiful humans. I am coming to you from the jungles in Costa Rica. And yeah, I've been here for about 10 days now. And um, it's served as the runway leading up to a week of ayahuasca ceremonies that I'll be sitting in um, in just a few days. And I felt called to share with you guys some of the pre-layers that are rising for me and offer a solo episode that highlights the before and after of my own journey that um, you know I'm being invited into and stepping into. So I find with you know my work with plant medicine that often in the decision, in the energy of the decision comes a powerful response from the field itself. So as soon as I made the decision to sit in ceremony in this way in Costa Rica, it was as if the um, field was listening. It, my life responded to start to give me opportunities to track where in in my personal curriculum, I get to start to pay attention to that may be uh, illuminated or supported or go through a healing process in this particular series of ceremonies. So of course, I can never plan what it's going to look like. I don't know how it's going to unfold or what, what information might come in, but I am tracking what type of curriculum is rising in my field at this time that I get to look at and place my attention on and get into prayer around as I step across this um, threshold into uh, the, the opportunity to really sit with um, grandmother medicine again for the first time since uh, the middle of last year. I believe. So I'm really looking forward to it and also have a healthy amount of um, just reverent fear. <laughs> you could say it's, it's actually not fear that I feel. I would say it's um, reverence, like the kind of reverence that um, <laughs> has been instilled through some pretty serious reprimanding <laughs> in the past and very intense experiences in the past. And every time I've worked with grandmother medicine, with ayahuasca. She's always given me exactly what I needed and nothing more than I could handle. So there's this, you know, healthy, reverent respect <laughs> that I have uh, stepping into this this week that's that's coming up. So on the runway leading into uh, this this time that I'm gifting myself, I've noticed several areas in my field kind of pop. And I think this is important, um, like awareness to have when, if, and when you 
either invest in yourself in a deep container, like with a coach or a mentor that you feel strongly guided toward, or in a, any type of facilitated plant medicine ceremony, that we hold it with this level of reverence and also recognize that when we invest the resources, which resources or money is just a reflection of your energy. You took a certain amount of your energy and invested it in an expression, an activity, a service that then, you know, lent itself to reciprocal return in energy in the form of money. So you invested your energy into something that afforded you a return in the form of money. So when you take that money that represents your energy and send it in the direction of a mentor, a teacher, a coach, a guide, a, a, a medicine journey, it's saying, here is my energy and I'm investing it in you. It's, a, it's like an energetic deposit. And when you hold it in that way and invest it with the prayer and recognize that that prayer is being received energetically, life will respond and give you the exact most precise catalysts for you to see yourself more clearly and start to recognize even before you get into the container, what areas are yours to expand through? What areas are yours to work around? So Growing up, if you listen to episode one, you'll you'll hear the full arc of this part of my journey. But growing up, I, I was diagnosed with scoliosis at a very young age. I wore a brace, a back brace for five years. I've had um, a, a major spinal fusion where the spine was manually straightened with rods uh, placed inside and then another, a second spinal surgery to have the rods taken out. Um, through actually a misdiagnosis where they thought the rods had gotten infected um, later, about uh, seven years later. So I've had, needless to say, a lot of activity around my spine and my back. And um, this week, my back has started really feeling aggravated, like for really no good reason. There hasn't been an increase in physical activity that would impact it. It's just all of the sudden, but because I have this perspective that I've described for all of you that I recognize in this like as ceremony week gets closer, of course, it makes sense that my, you know, the muscles around my spine are starting to t tighten and tense around it. And it, the spine has been one of the biggest guides for me and it responds in a real way. Um, to my emotional state, to my energetic state. And I, I really recognize that at a young age, you know, I, I had idi idiopathic scoliosis, which is a genetic, um, a genetic expression of scoliosis. And, you know, it's quite a literal manifestation of bending over backwards, right? Of this, this bending over backwards, walking on eggshells, um, kind of like contorting myself so that I wouldn't set off the alarms or, um, you know, get in trouble or um, experience what seemed to be catastrophic punishments. At a young age, I learned to bend over backwards. And from my perspective, I feel like that behavior pattern and that protector, which innocently came online, the one who would bend over backwards or people please or walk on eggshells to protect me from the experience of a catastrophic punishment or um, an explosive reaction um, from an authority figure towards me. That's a, a, a blessed protector I, aspect of myself that I recognize and have had the opportunity to continue to work with and integrate through love. So I recognize when that protector was born at a very, very, very young age before I had the tools to face off with the feeling of an authority figure punishing me or the feeling of, of you know, a, a father in rage or anger, right? So I built this protector in order to protect me from that. And I also feel that at a genetic level, the protection from that, the action of bending over backwards activated at the root the scoliosis that then I got to watch progress from age eight to 13 into the full S curve that demanded the, the full spinal fusion. So as this ceremony that I'm stepping into approaches and I recognize also, and I'll share a little bit more about this, that a huge part of my curriculum at this time has been to, um, heal my relationship with the masculine. And a lot of this, you know, 
the root of a lot of that behavior patterning comes through my relationship with my father, which has gone through a massive healing over the years. And at that time, there was certainly uh, some major root points in connection to my relationship with my father that I believe are connected to that scoliosis, the expression of the scoliosis. And so as the ceremony has gotten closer, I can see how it makes sense that my spine is starting to um, activate and um, the muscles around it are tensing up and feeling super tight. It almost feels like this gripping coming online. And again, this is the pre-show, you know what I mean? So I don't know what what will occur inside the ceremony space, what what healing opportunities will be presented, how it will look. And it's I've learned through my work in this way that it's really important not to need to know. <laughs> Like it's really important to let go of the need to know because whenever I think it's going to go a certain way, it definitely does not. So I'm I'm in this you know really deep trust and surrender around whatever is meant to occur will occur, and at the same time I am tracking. Okay, so this spinal piece is is coming up, and and I get to become really curious about that. So yeah, that's one piece that has um, been rising, and I'm paying attention to along this through line of healing my relationship with the masculine. This is another area of curriculum that has risen during this phase, uh, leading up into ceremony. So, um, you know, I've, I've fallen in love with a beautiful man who I was seeing for six months before he left for a three month Vedic meditation initiator training, which is a really, um, deep initiation. And I, and I deeply, honor and respect him for the devotion it takes and his love for all that he's stepping into as he steps into his dharma. It's it's really been incredible to witness. And while we are still together, his um, exit, like his leaving for three months, because uh, our love is so deep, it was like the perfect catalyst to activate this deep core wounding in me around um, the fear of, of, of loss of, you know, getting to look at my relationship and, and trust in love and, and trust in life in general, specifically when it's connected to um, my relationship with men, you know, like the stability that from an early age, I actually didn't get to experience with my own father because of his journey, his healing journey. And at an, at a young age, he was struggling with addiction in and out of treatment. And I'm, I'm in my journey of healing the impact that that had on me, you know, the unpredictability, the inconsistency, the in and outness of it. And, you know, while he has been and still is very present in my life, when he was struggling with his addiction, you know, pattern, and it was in this unpredictable state, he would manifest in a very unpredictable expression. And so as in my younger years, I recognized that that had a, a pretty significant impact on me in really um, trusting love because the water was brackish. You know, there was so much love and still is so much love that is so true with my dad. You know, like we love each other. We have always loved each other and I've always felt his love. And when that addiction patterning was expressing itself through his own curriculum, through his own healing that, that was needing to happen and, and is in its own process, right? Cause I've done as, as much of work around that as I have been able to up until this point. I'm curious if there's more that will come this during this next week. But for the most part, I can really see my dad and I can see the, the place from which he came and the healing journey that the whole line on that side, you know, gets to um, participate in. Right. So there's there's a perspective around all of it that I that I really get. In fact, I in my earlier part of my journey, you know, went through my own struggles with addiction. And it's it's a piece that we've all many, you know. And it's a piece that I've really gotten to sit with inside of myself. What's underneath, you know, the need to numb, the need to escape. What's the root underneath that? And so with my dad, in my early years growing up, there was this inconsistent 
energetic that um, confused me because the love was true. The love was real. And so when the expression from my primary male figure would come through conditions and um, reactivity and explosiveness and these um, like unpredictable layers, and at the same time, I could feel how much he loved me and that that love underneath all of that is real and true. It confused my uh, system in a way to sort out love and like wounding, you know, to really be able to sort out what is love and coming from love and what's coming from wounding. And can I really trust the love and trust that it's not going to go away? that it's not going to, you know, um, be taken or be threatened or be held in some condition, like that it's sturdy and stable and, and there. And so what I'm experiencing with my partner, David, who is about seven weeks in now to his Vedic uh, meditation initiator training, is a man who has shown up very consistently as a stand in the loving and has leaned in and fully chosen me and has met me in every way that I desire. And so in the face of this man who is quite literally a six foot four, like super sturdy, giant tree of a man, like could not be more stable and just like, ah, like a nervous system coming into coherence with this man is such a blessing. Like he's, he's a very trustable being. So I've, done enough work now, I recognize to be a match for, you know, the, the men over the past five years that I've had the blessing to partner with, you know, my prior partner, Oren, also a really incredible, very trustable being. And so I got to receive that from him. And now with David, I'm in the presence of a man who is a man that I fully, fully trust. So sitting with that reflection and then feeling the parts in me that are rising, that are feeling this, um, it feels like insecurity coming up. It feels like a, like a, a, a fearful, like, um, shakiness in my, in my being are the, some of the things I'm feeling as I get closer to this ceremony rising. And it's, as David and I explore what it means to choose into the next chapter of our relationship and are both choosing that powerfully. Um, and it's, I was actually having a conversation with my dear friend, Adam Roa today, and he, he reflected something that I thought was powerful in that in relationship, we choose in chapters, you know, so you choose into the first chapter of like, I'm in, I, I feel all of the the love that's flowing between us and I'm, I'm fully in and you choose into that chapter. And then there's the chapter of, you know, okay, let's go deeper and, and start to create more of our lives together and meet each other's friends and merge in a deeper way. And then you move through that chapter and then it's time to choose into the next chapter of, wow, like living together and, you know, creating home together, you know, creating community together, creating more of your breakfasts and your dinners and waking up and going to sleep together and, you know, really getting to deepen in that way. And you choose that chapter powerfully. And then as that chapter continues through, then comes the chapter of like, okay, the next chapter, do we choose that we want to create you know, family together to explore a deeper level of union and, and, you know, in investing in everything in a deeper way together. These are all, you know, threshold points and, and opportunities to choose powerfully. And so as I find myself at, at one of these opportunities to choose powerfully and everything in my being is choosing myself and this man in our relationship powerfully, like, of course, the love is so clear and I'm meeting the reflection of, of him choosing me powerfully. And also we both recognize that while we can fully choose each other and choose into this next chapter, we also get to embrace the truth that over the course of a life, we don't know what we don't know. And we get to always trust life, right? And, and be in, in the devotion to that 
while on the human level being in devotion to each other. That's the idea of the ultimate devotion is in devotion to life, like each individual in devotion to life, in devotion to our own higher selves, in devotion to source. And then that becomes the umbrella that holds the, the union, the relationship, the love, where the devotion from that place can flow into the, the commitment in the relationship itself. And the highest devotion is always to life. So it's been such an you know, it's, it's always in, in, in most of my relationships and especially my, my current relationship and my last one, the more conscious I've become over the last five years, it's been this dance of being all in and choosing powerfully and giving everything I have to it with the full intention of it being the, a long-term love, you know, that lasts and also not holding on too tight, like so tightly that it suffocates it. Because that tight holding on comes from a lack. It comes from a fear of what if it doesn't work and trying to control it. And that will actually like grip hold it in such a way that the love can't even flow through it anymore. So it's actually counterproductive. So it's this dance between being all in and giving like full, full yes to it. And also like surrendering into the trust over and over and over again. So that's the aim and that's the usual state that it, I, I give myself an opportunity to inhabit, that I, that's my aim to inhabit. And leading up to this ceremony, <laughs> this week of ceremonies, I have been witnessing my um, material rise that comes from that root masculine wounding of is this a love I can trust? Is it going to waver, shake, go away? Am I confusing the truth of the love with something that's different, right? That's, that's something that might come out of nowhere or, you know, it's all my own stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with my partner. It's all from my core original wounding that I get to look at. So I've, it's the, the alchemy, the combination, the perfection of the um, opportunity to deepen within myself, the intention to heal my relationship with the masculine in general, and the chapter that David and I are choosing that is the catalyst. It's like the, the configuration of catalysts that are causing this material to rise in me for me to look at when I go into the ceremony space, when I, when I go into the medicine this week. So I'm very curious to find out, you know, what's there and, and to receive any deeper insights around what it looks like to meet myself at a depth that goes beyond anything that I, that I may have experienced in the past. Um, and it's been a very synchronistic and incredible journey as I've also been in a seven month feminine embodiment immersion with John Wineland since September of 2021, something like that. It's a seven month immersion with John Wineland. And as a part of that immersion, just as my partner left for his three month training, it was within four days of his departure, which of course was part of the, the catalyst that began to bring up this feeling in me of, um, you know, fear or insecurity, you know, that the fear of essentially getting my heart broken or loss of love, which it's of course, always, we recognize that love to the degree that we love is the degree that we get to be willing to lose. We recognize that they, they ultimately are two sides of the coin and like tell that to my little girl, you know what I mean? When she really comes up, she comes up. And so I have compassion simultaneously for this part of myself when, when she rises and it's very much rooted in the relationship I've had with the masculine in the early, early past. And then of course, elements of that show up in subsequent romantic relationships or have shown up in subsequent romantic relationships throughout my life. And so I feel like a huge part of the threshold I'm in now is, is actually getting underneath at a level that goes deeper than anything I've experienced before the, the root of this, um, wounding around trust in the masculine to hold and, you know, the, the masculine is, is also like God, life, energy, you know, father, son, this like life force energy 
that is the driving force of, of all life. So if I, it's, it's like trusting not only my, my self, like the masculine within me, not only healing my relationship with my father, but healing my relationship with the great father, right? With the great father, the, the father that is life. And of course, then there's a trickle down that connects with all of my male romantic partners, you know, so, so, uh, you're welcome in the future, uh, David <laughs> for this work that I'm doing now. And I can see how it will really, um, lend itself to, um, a deeper level of trust and freedom and love because they're all the same thing. <laughs> You know, with the more you love, the more freedom you feel and the more free you feel, you, the more that you can love. Like it's, I feel it's all connected. So as soon as David left within just a few days on the next uh, call I had in this John Wyland container, the assignment that the team gave us was this masculine reconciliation process. And a part of this well, what this process is, is essentially making a list of the 10 most important male figures in your life and answering questions like, you know, how did I judge, castrate, or punish him for real or perceived misbehavior? Where was I selfish? Um, where did he try to take the lead and I wouldn't let him? Where did I withhold the truth of my heart? Where did I withhold my love? You know, so it's really looking at the all of my relationships with the masculine and letting go of any level of victim consciousness around what any of my past partners have done to me, how that, you know, impacted me really letting go of it being anything about any of that and holding the intention for this process to actually serve as an unhooking through radical responsibility, through radical ownership of whatever my part in it was you know, and really owning that. So I've been making this list while my, my partner is in this training of the 10 most impactful uh, male figures in my life, including my dad, including my grandfather, including all of the partners that I've had um, throughout my life so far. You know, the, those that have lied to me, cheated on me. I've been through the ringer um, with many of them and I'm looking at it through this new lens, which completely takes me out of any level of this happened to me and I get to see where this happened in any way where there was any negativity still being held in the relationship where I'm looking back on it and, and, and with any lens of resistance because if there's resistance or energy in any way still there, there's still some level of, of hook and it's an opportunity in service of my freedom, my liberation and the, the choice I'm making to step into this next chapter as the me who is free of any past wounding that I'm holding or of as much of past wounding that I'm holding as I can be and whatever's still there I get to love. Of course, I think it's important to, to reframe that and say that because it, and this is a side note, but I noticed that as we move through these transformational processes and this healing work, this idea of perfection that we have to like get rid of all of our wounding and heal all of our wounding and then we can create the life that we want and then we can receive the partner that we want. I want to call bullshit on that. I think that, you know, we get to relentlessly devote ourselves to our freedom, to our healing, to being as much the expression of love as we possibly can. And Let's let go of any ideal that it has to be perfect or look perfect because I feel like an expression of the ultimate love is to allow ourselves to have the breath, the freedom, the permission to also be imperfect at times, to have shadow aspects that pop up, to have some wounding that might still be there. And if it shows up in any way in our lives, the capacity to love it unconditionally, to accept ourselves in that, to not judge it and resist it and add these overlays on top of something that might already feel really, really challenging of this is bad or wrong, or I shouldn't be feeling this or, Oh my God, I haven't gotten there yet and completed this work. That is 
the opposite of the aim to me. So <laughs> this just feels like an important note that as if you're listening to this, I imagine that you are doing your work to be free and to be of love and to um, hold your entire family with, with love and compassion while also you know, looking at what's yours to heal in connection to your origins, you know, and a lot of these origin, you know, woundings take time. They take time. And the energy of patience and compassion is central to really afford ourselves the energetic space that we need for true healing to happen. So I want to also like really affirm that it's vulnerable for me to share this period and that I don't know what's going to come in these ceremonies this week. And while of course my aim is for like quantum expansion and massive release of much of what's coming up for me that I'm at least of what I'm aware of at this time, I also give myself full permission for it to take as long as it needs to. And even if we just chip a little bit off the top, top of an iceberg, that's okay. And, and me treating myself in that way, I know makes me a match for my partner who also treats me in that way, who also holds me with unconditional love and compassion. My partner in that reflection is not demanding that I do this work. You know what I mean? It's not, he's not asking me to do it. Much of it is it's perfectly timed. And this is part of what I want to share is well, it's perfectly timed that during this phase in this chapter, these three months, it's actually this three month container that I have an opportunity to do my work and look at what's mine to heal in connection to my relationship to the masculine that actually has nothing to do with him. And so if he were here with me by my side, it could either put a like nice, you know, soothing balm over it where I wouldn't really have to look at it or could potentially trigger some of these things that are coming up anyway. And then I, the risk is that I would project it onto him as if it has anything to do with him and the truth is it doesn't. So how perfect is it that I have this three-month period of time to really work on my relationship with the masculine? It's, it's really synchronistic and, and profoundly timed, you know, as it, which is an opportunity for me to become more of a match to the version of myself that lives in this next chapter of life, however that looks, that both of us are choosing. And the main thing is, regardless of how anything else looks, I'm choosing this for myself, right? Like this is central material for me to get to look at. So as I've done this healing work, which is also wildly timed in the John Wineland container to come up and be in this practice of really listening out and looking deeply at how I showed up in these relationships in my life. And then ultimately actually calling the, these men, you know, and, and, and having real conversations with them with a very clear intention to, um, take full ownership and responsibility for whatever was mine um, to hold in, in the completion of those relationships and the intention to like really arrive in a total and true um, completion that is also healing the relationship with the masculine. Because as you know, there's two sides of the coin always. So healing my relationship with the men, the masculine that has shown up in my life and quite literally healing my relationship with them where there's no energy. I'm clearing the field of blame, of wrong making, of you did this to me and I'm showing up in full like humble looking at myself and how I could have actually shown up better is giving me a pathway to learn how to show up better in my current relationship. By looking at how I didn't show up in certain ways in my last relationship, in the one before that, in my relationship with my father, right? In my relationship with my grandfather, like it, it's completely letting go of where they could have shown up more for me. But as, as the feminine expression in that dynamic with a strong masculine as well, I might say within myself, but in that dynamic, I'm bringing the, the feminine presence and how could I have, um, you know, brought more and really owning that with the intention of letting go of anything that is, um, no longer true, 
right, of any level of entanglement that is no longer true because it's not about getting anything from them. It's about freeing both of us. And so I'm, I haven't started making these calls yet. And of course, you know, part of the direction is only really making calls with and contacting those who, you know, we were not in abusive dynamics with or anything like that. If it was any sort of abusive dynamic, you can do the practice with just an energetic exchange and more of a gestalt framework and calling that person's energy in. So yeah, so I haven't started making these calls yet. Um, it, it does feel like in many ways it's going to be very cathartic. I think in my history I've done enough blaming of the men in my life, and and also in some ways, yeah, there's there's many ways that you know the men in, in that I've been in past relationships with did not show up for me or could have shown up better. In the same ways that I you know, could have shown up better. And so there's something freeing about looking at that. And also, you know, working with a male facilitator in John Wineland, who's holding space for a large group of of women has been actually very educational for me in many ways to get the perspective from a totally unbiased masculine figure who is um, inviting us into the practice of inhabiting more of our you know, feminine hearts and open heartedness and to keep that heart open and fully, you know, source and our energy, the emotional energy and offer it up as a gift. And, and, you know, just, I'm learning so much about through seeing how I could have shown up better in the past, how I can show up even more in my, in my current relationship, which feels so expansive and exciting. And it's also on the other side of the threshold that is this particular, um, like pool of healing (laughs) that I'm getting to explore, you know? And, um, it was so interesting, you know, in, in speaking to more of what the expanse I've been experiencing in, in the, in this container, they, um, I had a group at the end of our first immersion and my, my, my current partner, David had just left to um, visit his family in Israel for a few weeks. And one of the exercises that they gave me, which was such an edge, let's talk about living life beyond the edge was to record myself embodying a different archetype every single day, like fully the full spectrum from the seductress to the sloth, to the like school girl. Um, to the black widow, like the full spectrum of archetypes. And I actually like got outfits and did this whole thing and, and send him a video one minute every single day of myself embodying a different archetype. And at first when they told me that that was my practice, I, everything in me was like, no way. We'd only been together for a couple of months at that time. It just felt like such an edge to let him see the full spectrum of me leaning into all of these different expressions and just, you know, got to look at every fear that was coming up in me. Like, what if he thinks I'm crazy? Like, what if he judges me? Like, what if I push him away? This feels like too much, like all of that. And you know what the truth is? If any of that was too much or, or crazy or like too much of a stretch for him, then the truth is he wouldn't be the right guy for me. So me not doing that and being careful and cautious so that I try to make sure that I don't like lose this man was more, I realized that's actually more uncomfortable than going for it and actually leaning into this and, 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 and really exploring my edges right in front of him. And it was one of the most like liberating experiences for me because it deepened us so much. It was such a fun way to stay in touch from, you know, across the ocean and to give him an opportunity to like get to know me and all of these whole variety of wild expressions. And it was also, you know, very sexy because some of them are very sexy. So I got to stretch into my own like sexual expression and my own expanse in that way, um, which was also very powerful. So, you know, letting myself be seen and known and loved unconditionally has been one of the most profound liberation technologies in relationship that I've ever been blessed to receive. Being held in an unconditional space of no matter whatness in the full spectrum of who I be, not just when I'm sending archetypal, you know, wild videos, but when I'm like actually in a deep, vulnerable, emotional, emotional process and, and really like feeling the, the most 
the parts of myself that I've deemed the most unlovable in the past and being witnessed in that and held by a man who is a stand for me and in the unconditional, no matter whatness of our love and being held in that reflection and that pure presence, unshakable is such a gift as a, as a woman. And I can only speak from my own experience, but my sense is that for most women, that would be such a gift. And it's been in that field with my prior partner and with my current partner, David, where I've ha- had the gift and the blessing of feeling loved in that way that I have cr- felt reference points in me of how and where I can love myself even deeper. You know, it's, it's such a gift. And what I've learned also is that it's equal and opposite a gift when we can own our desires without a demand attached to it. And when we can be in the full expression of our feminine essence and it's multicolored, wild, chaotic, unpredictable mess, all of it, and offer that as a gift without a need attached to it. If you feel the difference, it it's enlivening. You know, the, what I've, what I've been told from the men in my life is it's, it's enlivening, it's magnetic, it's attractive, it's interesting, it's fascinating, you know, it's an opportunity for them to sharpen their sword of, of penetrating presence and to become a, a wider, vaster, stronger, more solid and stable container for the fullness of, of who we are and what it is that we have to bring. But it's only when we start judging as, as the feminine expression what it is that we have to bring and and making it wrong and shaming ourselves for it that we fear that, you know, our partner might leave or might not love us in that. And that's when there starts to feel like there's like uh, something more needed on the other side of it. And that's where I've noticed in my own experience, it can get a little bit tricky. So I'm so grateful for this time that I've been in. And I recognize that through the choice that I've made to step into this next chapter of my life, of love, of co-creatorship, I get to look at anything within me that may not be a match and really see what's coming from fear and wounding. What are the aspects and protectors that come up from that fear and wounding? What does the part of me that is in fear and has experienced wounding actually need to feel completely safe, completely secure, totally sound in, in, in the no matter whatness of my own being, being held by my own masculine energy so that I can fully trust the masculine that is life, force, energy, right? So this time as I, as I continue to get closer just a few days out, of stepping into this one week container, um, where I get to meet grandmother again, I I'm recognizing these patterns. I'm recognizing these patterns and I'm recognizing the way that I'm already through the journey I've been on last year, which I, I believe I shared about in episode one as well, started to build this like deep trust in life that I had never experienced before. And this feels like the next level of it in the deep trust in love the deep trust in love. And so looking at really anything that's in the way of that, anything that's not a match to that and not looking at it with judgment, but, but looking at it with compassion and recognizing that like the real, true, authentic action steps to free myself from, you know, past memories of past pains where I've projected fault on, on, you know, past partners and things like that the opportunity to free myself of that through having real conversations, you know, with, with, in service of, of a a true, true completion, a completion of whatever was untrue, you know, feel that because of course with my father, the, the, it's in service to the completion of whatever's untrue. And it's simultaneously in service to the continuation and continued growth and flowering and blossoming and deepening and widening of whatever is true in that love that I described, right? Always the aim is to add more to that which is true and of love. Same thing with, you know, past partners, that which was true and of love, the romantic expression of that love has expired. But on the other side of the death is always the truth. So how can we This is the exploration of really letting go and completing that which was entangled, 
you know, of, of judgment or blame or fault and untrue, untangling that and letting that go and letting that expression complete itself fully. Even if it's with a partner that was from 10 years ago, I'm so interested because I've never done this before to see energetically if there are subtle levels of clearing that occur in my being through just a, a, a deep completion in that way. Right. So in those relationships that are older, there may not be a truth of an expression that wants to continue. It may just be in service of a total completion and a mutual acknowledgement. In more recent past relationships, there is a continuation of a, a, a love in a relationship that is true. It's just not in its romantic form. Right. So on the other side of the death of the romantic form, by completing it and acknowledge and being in mutual acknowledgement and true freedom in that there's a liberation of the truth of what is there on the other side of that death the truth of the love and the friendship and the connection and the the creative connection can still be there but in order for it to still be there and i think this is true after any romantic relationship the entanglement the, the that may still be there on any level gets to be completed and it's it com fully completed. Otherwise, it's it's gray, you know. And and when there's those gray energetics, it takes up space in the field and and can block the fullness of the the depth of the union that is present in our current relationships to unfold itself, or the, in the relationship that we're calling in, depending where you're at in the process. So I'm sharing to you from, you know, from the field, notes from the field as I. Um, investigate this journey for myself without necessarily having any, you know, answers, but just the intention to share with you, um, you know, in service of inspiring, um, relatability and, um, perhaps some layers of, um, expanse and healing that you might receive through relating to my journey and where I'm at at this time. And if you are relating to um, some of the pieces that I've shared, I would so invite you to reach out. Um, my Instagram is at Zahara Zimring. You can also find uh, more of me via the website that'll all be in the show notes. And yeah, I'd love to hear from you, you know, if, if you're also in this journey it, that feels similar in any way that's true for you. It's, it's always um, powerful to know that we aren't alone in the journey. And so sharing with all of you from this place of pre fully, fully, fully processed, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a bit safer to share reflectively and retrospectively once a, a process has completed itself and all the revelations and insights and clarity and happenings have already come into form and the truth is that's not the place I'm sharing from tonight. So I appreciate you for fully receiving me and relating in all the ways that are true for you. And it's my intention to share another episode on the other side of this week long um, series of ceremonies that I'm going to be sitting in um, here in Costa Rica. And I'll share with all of you the insights and um, any expanse or information that has come in on the other side. Um, I am just excited as you are <laughs> to find out what is on the other side of this week. And I so appreciate you offering up your ears and your hearts. And as always, I deeply honor you for the courage it takes to live your life beyond the edge. Thanks for joining. Thank you all for creating this space to receive this transmission and for having the courage that it takes to live your life beyond the edge. If you feel the call to go deeper with me privately or explore the dojo ecosystem, the best place to start is by visiting zaharazimring.com and taking your free micro dojo. You can also find me on Instagram at Zahara Zimring, and I love hearing from you guys. So feel free to send me messages, make comments, and I will absolutely get back to you. I also would deeply appreciate if this episode or any of these episodes have touched your heart. Leave a review as it really supports this show in touching more hearts and more lives all around the world. Thank you for joining and I'll see you next time.